was your first car? My first car was a 77 Chevy Caprice Classic. It was red with a gold trim. It had two bucket seats in the front and a full-on couch in the back. It also had electric windows and electric seats. Those electric seats only had two functions. They moved the seat back up and down and also moved the entire seat closer and farther away from the steering column. Sadly, those functions broke about a month after I took ownership. Thank goodness we have come a long way since then, because sitting on pillows and phone books in order to reach the pedals was not fun at all. But what all goes into our fancy electric seats? Have you ever thought about what kind of design considerations we need to think about when it comes to designing the perfect automotive seat? Well, maybe you should. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Today's automotive seat design must keep in mind size, cost, battery life, and even passing EMC testing. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Rick Brovarski from Infineon and I investigate the newest innovations in automotive electronic seat control. We take a closer look at the anatomy of power seats today, the role that an ECU plays in the control of electronic seats, and how Infineon chipset offerings can help you with your next smart power seat design. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Infineon. Hi, Rick. Thank you so much for joining me. Hey, thanks. Glad to be here. Excellent. Okay, so we're talking about seat control in automotive designs. But Rick, before we dig into the details, what kind of seat functions are we really talking about here? Well, the seat and its functions, they're an essential part of cabin comfort and safety one of the direct interfaces to the driver and the passenger. It's an important contributor to the user experience, and it's a differentiator for the car maker. But the term seat control can cover many different aspects of seat control, so such as uh, seat adjustment or seat movement. There's a grab bag we call seat comfort. The bolsters, lumbar support, massage, heating, and then also climate functions like cooling or ventilation. There are also seat safety functions, so something like a seat belt pretensioner which is part of the vehicle safety systems, also seat passenger detection. But for this talk, we'll focus on uh, electronic control units, you know, the modules that actually do seat positioning and climate control. So this includes multimotor applications, such as you know, power seat, which sometimes also include a uh, memory seat, and then also uh, power folding seats, like you might see in the second or third row of like a passenger vehicle, like a big SUV, but also can include the heating, the cooling and ventilation, the climate functions. And these things can be standalone ECUs, or they might be all integrated together. That's what we'll be talking about. Excellent. So can we talk specifically about what goes into powering a seat? When we look at the vehicle seat, you know, between the skin, what we see on the outside, and then the frame and inside the padding, a seat can be packed up with wiring. There can be, you know, multiple ECUs, electronic control units baked into it. Motors, sensors I talked about, uh, heating, cooling elements, fans, airbags, bladders, and even more. So for the OEM, you know, saving space is a great concern. Having a thinner seat, you know, creates more cabin space. We've seen in the past that using relays in some of these modules that dictates a certain height for the ECU enclosure. And also as a stop-start functionality is becoming quite common now, and of course the rise of electric vehicles, the cabin environment is getting quieter and quieter. So the sound of the relays clicking can be considered a nuisance. And we even see some OEMs they specify silent switching for their seat control units. So the use of semiconductors in seat control units provides silent switching along with it supports the reductions in the, in the height of the ECU because a relay can be you know, a centimeter or so tall where you're measuring the thickness of uh, semiconductors in a millimeter or less. So when you're looking at you know, the full solution at the level of the ECU, the semiconductors, they're proven to provide cost savings compared to these relay-based solutions. Looking a little closer inside the seat there, I mentioned you know, the climate control. So when you hear about, say, cooled or ventilated seats, they might use a fan blowing or drawing the ambient air through perforations in the seat surface, little holes that might be even too small for you to see. But then there's uh, actively cooled seats. So actively cooled seats, they require some means to actually lower the temperature of the air in the surface there. Typically, this involves a Peltier element, also known as a thermoelectric device, or for short, just TED, T-E-D. And a Peltier element produces a temperature difference between the two sides when current is flowing. 
So depending on the direction of the DC current flow. So like a motor, they're driven in what we call an H-bridge configuration you know, with uh, two half bridges, four MOSFETs. But when the seats are cooled, we find passengers actually use the air conditioning a bit less. So that actually creates fuel savings and CO2 emissions. That makes sense. Now, when it comes to the power seats, what are the biggest design challenges we should consider? There's a small handful of top-level concerns for these designers of power seat ECUs. Primarily, you know, the solutions have to, as I mentioned earlier, enable size and cost reductions. You know, the feature content, the seat modules are growing, adding more position adjustments, haptic feedback can even be built into the seat these days. Other features like even the steering column and pedal adjust. Number one, integration, you know, enabling size and cost reduction. They also must operate very efficiently. So we have to reduce what we call key off current to help extend the battery life. And Infineon's devices are designed to be very efficient. So they have best in class quiescent currents, but also best in class operating currents. Not just the sleep current, but even the operating current is important because every milliamp becomes precious when you're running off of a battery. As always in automotive, designers are looking for high reliability, high robustness. As semiconductors continue to shrink, which is necessary for continued cost reductions, to maintain and improve reliability and robustness, our devices have to become smarter. They have to grow in intelligence to manage these fault conditions. These are you know, primarily motor drive applications and EMC testing, electromagnetic compatibility testing, is very important. This is especially true for motor control applications that use pulse width modulation or PWM for speed control. And you'll find that in, say, the soft starting or soft stopping of the seat travel. So Infineon's motor drive devices include a high level of configurability that help designers tune their EMC performance through software. And of course, we'll talk about this a bit more later on. And then lastly, it's an advantage to support multiple trim levels with minimum design effort and solution cost. So these seat modules, especially the, the higher end memory seat modules, tend to have high variability with extra features that are populated and depopulated depending on the vehicle trim level. So for example, the climate features may be taken in or taken out. I mentioned earlier, you know, the steering column adjust or even your pedal adjustment might be in the seat module, haptic feedbacks. So a lot of these extra features have lower take rates. So you need to populate them and depopulate them. So with this in mind, we designed our products as scalable families, keeping in mind this need for this flexibility and scalability. With these things in mind, Infineon provides full chipset solutions that address all of these top-level needs, enabling smart, safe, cost-effective, solid-state, smart power seat solutions. Excellent. Now, you mentioned seat adjustment earlier. Do position and climate control fit together with seat adjustment? Well, depending on the OEM, the position and the climate functions might be in separate modules. They might be integrated together. Or there can even be seat control units that actually control multiple seats from one ECU. So all of these things are possible. Let's look at an example block diagram, sort of a superset for a power seat module that includes both the position and the climate control. And we can break this design down into really three major pieces. There is the bi-directional motor control for position adjustment, the motors that move the seats up, down, forward, back, all of that. There are the climate functions, which can include heating elements, fans for ventilation, and uh, perhaps the thermoelectric devices for cooling and even heating that I mentioned earlier. And then there are the central functions of the ECU. So yeah, the brain, the microcontroller, power supply and communication, some sensors and other protective functions like say like the reverse battery that you see at the top of this diagram that I'm showing here. Excellent. So can we take a closer look at the ECU here? What all is involved? Yes, we will take a closer look at this so, because we provide an entire chipset solution. We have multiple options with differing levels of integration and scalability. At Infineon, we have a big catalog of automotive smart power products. But in the interest of time, let's look at some of the highlights and the key features that enable successful seat module designs. So where does position control fit in here? So for position control, which also includes power folding seats, so not only just you know, the driver's seat, passenger seat, but also say power folding seats, there's brush DC motors that normally range from like 5 amps to 20 amps DC, depending on the function and the size of the seat. So a common configuration for, say, a driver or passenger seat is to have four motors per seat, controlling like the angle of the backrest, the height of the seat, the tilt of the seat bottom, and then, of course, the forward and backwards motion of the entire seat. In the case of a power folding seat, where you're folding maybe an entire row of seats, they're typically like two larger motors that lower and raise the seat back. So again, depending on the function, the motors can be as small as five amps. Maybe a headrest might be even smaller. But for these, you know, moving the entire bench, that might be more like a 20 amp or maybe even a 30 amp motor there. But they're DC motors. 
And for these multi-motor applications, you're driving more than one motor, all of the top-level design concerns I mentioned earlier, they're addressed with a combination of Infineon's Motix gate drivers and Optimus MOSFETs. Okay, so let's talk about Motix MOSFET driver ICs. Can we dig into the details of those and what do they buy me as an engineer in this kind of application? Well, these are these Motex uh, TLE 92104 and TLE 92108 gate driver ICs. They enable size and cost reductions. They save a lot on external components and on PCB space through integration. And these ICs, they integrate four half bridges or eight half bridges, depending on which one you buy, the 104 or the 108. And they provide best-in-class quiescent current. So we're helping to create very efficient designs. And these devices eliminate many external components. We integrate current sinks and current sources that enable a wide range of diagnostics and also include current sense op amps. And the outputs of those are used both internally and they're also available externally for the microcontroller. And so that enables a lot of the high reliability and high robustness with a lot of uh, protections and diagnostics. So beyond the industry standard feature of hard short circuit detection, every gate driver out there has hard short circuit detection. The 92104 and 92108, they also feature a configurable soft short circuit detection, which can help offload the microcontroller, reducing software effort and the time needed for detection and reaction. And namely, they can shut off the endangered MOSFET. Very, very, very short reaction time can also enable the use of lower power MOSFETs, potentially saving further costs in both PCB space and device price. And I actually have real world testimonials from customers who have told me that, hey, This feature did, in fact, enable them to reduce the size of their MOSFETs, reducing that cost, and their board space actually helped pay for the redesign to start using the TLE-92108. So very real-world example of that. Cool. Now, I know that passing EMC testing without compromising power dissipation can be a challenge here. So can these Motex multi-driver ICs help me here as well? So yeah, certainly passing EMC testing without compromising power dissipation, that is a major pain point for designers. It's, again, especially true for motor control applications that use pulse width modulation for speed control, like as I mentioned earlier, the soft starting and and soft stopping of the seat travel. So Infineon has a feature, a patented feature that we call adaptive MOSFET control that provides multi-stage programmable gate drive currents. What does this do? It allows you to tune the EMC performance via software without compromising the power dissipation. This multi-stage slew-way control enables EMC tuning via the SPI port, including adjusting the slew rate with independence from the dead time and the turn-on and turn-off delays. So if that doesn't mean anything to you, you can go to our website here. You can go to the landing page for seat control or to the landing page for the TLE 92108 or 92104. And there are some nice app notes that explain this more in depth. Along with that, there's also onboard measurement and self-adaption of the external MOSFET switching times that also helps enable the balancing of the power dissipation versus the EMC performance, and also even adjusts for, say, MOSFET lot-to-lot variations, or even if you have to change MOSFETs from, say, one supplier to another supplier, it'll actually help reduce the need for end-of-line calibration effort. Again, complicated topic, but more information is available at our landing page. And lastly, these devices also bring an advantage in supporting multiple trim levels with minimal design effort and solution cost. As I mentioned, memory seat modules tend to have high variability with extra features that are populated and depopulated depending on the vehicle trim level, things like the column and pedal adjust, haptic feedback, and so on and so forth. So the TLE 92104 and TLE 92108, they have four and eight half bridge drivers respectively. If you notice, actually, the block diagram on the left-hand side just changed from driving four motors to driving just two motors. These two devices share the same package, the pinout, and can even share the same software, enabling a scalable design with minimal effort and without PCB changes. And there are customers in the real world who are taking advantage of this. With one PCB layout, they populate the device, only the device they need. They only pay for eight half bridges when they need it, and they only pay for four half bridges when they need that. Cool. Now, space is always an issue with automotive designs, whether from package sizes of our components or the PCB layout itself. So what would you suggest to help with saving space? Well, looking further at this thing, you know, it's not enough just to consider the package sizes, but also the layout requirements. So in motor drive applications like power seat modules, the combination of the TLE 92-104-108 gate drivers with external MOSFETs creates a more compact solution than using either relays or using, say, smart high side switches and smart low side switches. As I mentioned earlier, with the gate driver ICs, we integrate a lot of what were formerly external components and pull them up into the device. And now looking at the other piece of this, which is the MOSFETs. 
Dual MOSFETs are quite common, two MOSFETs in one package, but they are not optimized for a PCB layout that supports half bridge and H bridge configurations like we need in motor drive, as you can see on the left hand side. There's a lot of routing issues. Sure, there's two MOSFETs in this package, but you have to run a lot of traces all around the outside of that packaging here. So what we have is our new Optimos 6 SSO8 half bridge devices, which are already internally configured as half bridges. So the wiring is done on the inside, saving on PCB routing and also reducing stray inductances. So in addition to minimizing the routing of the PCB traces, they save on external EMC filtering because they avoid the big voltage spikes that can be caused by the stray inductances on longer PCB traces. And so along with these new half bridge configured MOSFETs, we do of course offer many other package options, including standard dual MOSFETs and the popular but tiny S308 single MOSFETs and many others, which can be found at infineon.com slash automotive MOSFETs. Okay, so another area you mentioned was climate control. Can we look at that aspect of seat control a bit more? Sure, of course. More advanced heated and cooled seats include the thermoelectric devices that I mentioned earlier. They're driven in H-bridge configuration, so they provide heating or cooling depending on the direction of the current, where again, the TLE 92104, the 92108, combined with our MOSFETs, they're excellent solutions. But simpler designs may use resistive heater elements and fans, and these are usually all driven by smart high side switches. And a seat heater is typically a five amp resistive load. And there's usually two per seat, you know, one for the seat surface and one for the backrest. And these heater elements can be driven separately or sometimes are driven in parallel as a single 10 amp load. And the temperature level can be varied through slow speed pulse width modulation, which means turning them on and off to vary the power. And, and usually this is done quite slowly in a range somewhere below like 10 hertz, single digit hertz. And a trend is emerging, though, to also include a low side switch for safety, which would ensure that the heater element can be turned off in the case there is a short circuit. On the high side of the circuit, you still have a path on the bottom, a switch on the bottom where you can cut off the current flowing that because we don't want someone to get burned. And ventilation fans, they're usually just unidirectional brush DC motors, maybe one and a half amps, two amps. And these are typically also driven by smart high side switches. So what kind of solution does Infineon have to help me out in this case? Well, we are the kings of smart high side switches. Infineon's scalable Profet Plus 2 family of smart high side switches for 12 volt applications specifically includes devices for driving both the seat heaters and the ventilation fans. And they provide best in class quiescent current and operating current and advanced diagnostics and protection functions. The Profets have a long successful history in driving seat heater elements and many other loads. And the Profet Plus 2, the new BTS 7 series, is Infineon's latest family of Profets. And they cover a wide RDS on range from 1.2 milliohms up to 200 milliohms with single channel and dual channel devices and pin compatible packages. If you see the top of the page here, the ESP and the EPP series, they are designed for high current applications like the heating and uh, power distribution. And their protections in manufacturing are designed for these applications. And then the EPA family down below, they're more for say medium and, and lower current applications. In electric vehicle, you know, I mentioned this earlier, Every milliamp is precious for extending the range of the travel, the battery life. And as more features are added to the ECUs, leading to more and more smart switches, great for Infineon, the overall operating current becomes more critical. So not just the sleep current, but even the operating current. Because if you can imagine, you're adding up, you know, two, four, six, eight, suddenly 12 of these devices. So while they may be passing a lot of current, the operating current of each device begins to add up. And the Profet Plus 2 12 volt family provides outstanding energy efficiency with reduced current consumption, not only in sleep mode, but also during operation. And to learn more, you can simply go to www.infineon.com slash profet. What about the other central functions of the ECU? Can Infineon assist me in this realm as well? Yeah, so we've talked a lot about the output side, you know, the power driving side of the things. Let's get away from the load drivers and look at the rest of the chipset, which is the solutions for the central functions of the ECU. Yes, microcontrollers, power supply, communication, sensors, and again, further MOSFETs for, say, central protection against uh, reverse battery situations. Starting with the microcontroller, we have our Treveo 2 series of 32-bit ARM-based microcontrollers, which provides scalability with respect to, uh, say, performance, package, memory, or peripherals, security, and safety implementation. And while the Treveo 2 family scales all the way from 512 kilobytes of memory up to 8 megabytes of flash memory, and can even use the ARM Cortex-M4 and M7 microcontroller cores, 
The devices most fitting to typical seat modules are shown here with like one megabyte and two megabytes of flash and using the Cortex M4. Traveo 2 also reduces key off current and extends battery life with ultra low power consumption in active mode as well as five other power modes that range from sleep mode down to hibernation mode. And while seat modules today typically have an ASIL requirement of only QM, and if you're not familiar, that, that's the lowest ASIL rating, and the S in ASIL is safety level, there's a trend towards higher ASIL ratings. And the Treveo 2 family has a functional safety concept that enables ISO 26262 ASIL B with full functional safety in both hardware and software, supported with hardware safety manuals, FMDEAs, and safety documentation of our software products. So if you're not familiar with that language, you're probably not dealing with ASIL. If you are dealing with ASIL, then I think all that information is hopefully pretty helpful to you. Suffice it to say, the Traveo 2 is a big family of microcontrollers, but the two most likely candidates for seat modules are the CYT 2B7 and CYT 2B9 series that are shown here. So we also need to talk about power supply and communication here as well, right? What kind of solutions would you suggest in this case? Yeah, on power supply and communication, Seat module designers are seeking smaller integrated solutions, and they typically favor the use of system basis chips, which combine the functions of power supply and communication along with additional system support functions, such as say, offboard sensor supplies, wake up inputs, and other things. So, for seat modules, we have both our light SBC and our mid range plus SBC families, and they fit to the typical supply and communication requirements and also provide best in class quiescent current during sleep mode and even enable, say, wake up by switch inputs and CAN messages. So on the communication side, seat modules receive inputs from the switch packs mounted on the side of the seat, or perhaps on the center stack. And these can be wired directly or sent via LIN communication, L-I-N, or may come from messages on the CAN bus. So for example, often the module may be woken up by a signal from the main body controller, the BCM, and it might receive other information from the BCM via CAN messages. And the seat module might be a master or it might be a slave to another seat module. So given this, a typical seat module usually requires at least one CAN transceiver and at least one LIN transceiver, and sometimes two LIN transceivers. You know, a slave module or a simple just standalone seat heater controller might require only LIN. On the power supply side, with integrated low dropout voltage supplies of 150 milliamps or 250 milliamps, these SBCs, system basis chips, are well matched to the typical microcontrollers used in seat applications. And the mid-range SBCs, the mid-range plus SBCs, have been particularly successful in this application space. And if you are, say, using a 3.3 volt microcontroller, if needed, we also have variants that support the 3.3 volt cores with our VCC1 output. You simply add V33 to the end of a part name, and that's our 3.3 volt variants. But let's take a closer look at this mid-range plus SBC, which, again, is used in many, many seat module designs today. As I mentioned, you know, it typically communicates to the BCM via CAN, and LIN may be used to communicate with other slave seat modules, say like from the driver to the passenger seat, or to the switch panel mounted on the side of the seat. So supporting this need for scaling different LIN options, the Midrange Plus family has variants with zero, one, or two LIN transceivers here. This is the superset device that I'm showing here, but there are actually multiple members of this family. And adding to the reliability and robustness and ease of use, one key feature of the mid-range SBC and the light SBC is the limp home output. You can see this fail-safe box here at the very top center of this diagram here. And a typical application of this limp home feature is it enables a safe state by triggering some external hardware that can put the power outputs into a known safe state should there be trouble with the microcontroller. The high integration of the mid-range plus SBC, it reduces system and bomb cost and part placement and development effort, and then also PCB size. So rounding out the options for supply and communication, there's still one higher level of integration possible with a device called the Motix SBC, or also known as the Motor System IC. And this combines the key features of the mid-range plus system basis chip that I just showed, along with the TLE 92104 or TLE 92108 gate driver ICs. So really the greatest hits of those two devices we combine into one device. It has the power supply, the communication, has the gate drivers built in there, along with that adaptive MOSFET control feature which provides multi-state programmable gate drive currents that enables tuning of EMC through software. So this is one other option in our catalog. So this unique higher level of integration, it offers the lowest level of quiescent current, even when compared to our already best-in-class system basis chips and best-in-class gate driver ICs. The motor system IC also supports flexible designs with scalability of multiple features, as shown in the table here, you know, with and without LIN, 
two half bridges, four half bridges. So there's some scalability within this family as well. Coming back to the reliability and robustness, note that the 104 and 108 gate drivers, the light SBC and this motor system IC all include an external charge pump that makes it easier to implement reverse battery protection or a safety switch. So at the top of the diagram here, you'll see these two MOSFETs, top left, facing each other, what we call an anti-series arrangement. Some people just have one MOSFET there to protect against reverse battery current flow, sometimes two. Under certain conditions, you need to prevent flow of current in either direction. And there's a charge pump, again, built into this device that help enable that feature very, very, very easily. So circling back to Optimos, what kind of options do I have with this solution? So for reverse battery protection or the safety switch, you're going to need more MOSFETs, but they would be different MOSFETs than what you'd be using to drive the motors because this MOSFET has to be able to pass all of the current going into the module at one time. So the Optimos 6 40-volt family of single MOSFETs in the SS08 package are what we recommend for these functions. So Infineon is a market leader in power MOSFETs, both within and outside of the automotive market. We have a very broad portfolio of MOSFETs for nearly every occasion, but most typically it's the SS08 package types that are used for this application. So no discussion about automotive design would be complete without talking about sensors. So what kind of sensors are we looking at when it comes to seating applications? Since we're focused today primarily on seat position and on the climate side, it's important to track the position of the seat. And many designers are actually seeking a sensorless control scheme, but most designs today still use hall sensors to aid tracking of the seat position. Be aware these sensors, however, are they're not actually placed inside the seat control ECU. They're mounted in the metal frame of the seat, within the seat frame itself. And so they're not usually sourced with the seat control ECU, but are more likely to be specified and sourced by the seat manufacturer. So in some cases, the seat manufacturer, you know, the seat supplier, and the seat ECU supplier can be part of the same customer, but they still likely exist in separate divisions. I mean, the most common business model is that the seats and the seat control ECUs are sourced separately by the OEM. So Infineon has a broad portfolio of magnetic sensors, and here we highlight those most commonly used in seat position detection. Okay, so Rick, can you give me a big picture view of seat control ECU? So coming back to the main block diagram, you know, we could dive a lot deeper, but we've gone through a lot of the highlights of our chipset solution for seat control. Again, there are multiple options of different levels of integration and scalability, and whose key features do enable successful designs addressing the three major pieces of seat control. Remember, we have the bi-directional motor control for position adjustment. We have the climate functions, which can include heating elements, fans for ventilation, and perhaps those thermoelectric devices for cooling and heating. And then we have the central functions of the ECU, like the microcontroller, power supply and communication elements, sensors, and the other safety functions. So remembering these top-level system needs, size and cost reductions, reducing current draw while awake or asleep, reliability and robustness, passing EMC testing, and getting the most out of your design efforts by enabling reuse and flexibility, Infineon's chipset offering addresses all of these concerns while enabling smart, safe, cost-effective, solid-state smart power seat solutions. When you're thinking of electronic seat controller designs, think Infineon. Excellent. Well, I think that's all the time I have for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Rick. Thank you. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Infineon. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section at EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.